going to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is pursuing the call of God on your life. And so we're going to talk about finding our individual callings, and then we're going to talk about some things that God has called us all to do as believers. So if you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Philippians chapter 3, verse 12 through 15. It says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do is forget those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press towards the goal For the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. So we're in a spiritual maturity class. We're in, you know, we're in, we're here to learn how to be spiritual adults. And Paul says that if we're going to be spiritual adults, that this is something that we're going to have to focus on. We're going to have to focus on finding the call of God for our lives, pursuing that call, and walking in that. And so I think we all know that. Um, you know, when we got saved, we learned that we all have a purpose and a call. And we all, you know, have been put on this earth to do something important for God. But I think where a lot of people struggle is figuring out what they're called to do. And so, you know, I struggled with this for, for many years when I was, um, you know, newly married. And the Holy Spirit led me to um, some scriptures that he wanted me to. He said, if you will put these scriptures in your heart and speak them out of your mouth over yourself every time you think about your purpose, every time you're worrying about, am I, am I doing what God has called me to do? Am I, am I you know, what is, what is it that I'm put on this earth to do? He said, if you'll just go ahead and, and put these scriptures in your heart and speak them out of your mouth, he said, I will watch over them and I'll perform them in your life. And you will just naturally walk into what you're called to do without even having to think about it. You'll just, you know, I'll just direct your steps and I'll watch over that word and perform it in your life. And so I wanted to share a couple of those scriptures with you. And I have a whole list of scriptures that I've, that I've spoken over my life um, and, and that have allowed God to, um, the Holy Spirit to speak to my heart about what, I, what I'm called to do. And so if, you were, if you're interested in that whole list, then I'll be glad to email that to you. So just get back with me after the service. But I wanted to go, go through a couple of the most important ones. Um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. Emily, and I, I like it in the amplified version. Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. It says, For it is God who is all the while effectually at work in you, energizing and creating in you the power and the desire to will and to do for his good pleasure, satisfaction, and delight. And so this verse, if you'll, if you'll speak it out of your mouth, you'll put it in your heart, and you'll meditate on it, it will go to work in your life, and it will bring itself to pass in your life. And your desires will become God's desires, and God's desires will become your desires, and you will just, just find yourself walking into your purpose without even having to think twice about it. And so another one is... Um, Look, another couple. I'll go ahead and go through a couple more. Psalm 37, verse 23, says, The Lord directs my steps and delights in every detail of my life. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3, in the Amplified Version, says, I roll my works upon the Lord, and he causes my thoughts to come into alignment with his will, and so my plans are established and succeed. And so there again, there's the Lord ordering your steps. If you, God watches, the Bible says that God watches over his word to perform it in your life. So if you're speaking this out of your mouth on a daily basis, then your steps are automatically going to be ordered by the Lord. And your thoughts are automatically going to be turned into God's thoughts. And so your plans are going to automatically become God's plans for you. And you're just going to very simply walk into your purpose. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to wonder about it. It's just a matter of faith. You know, this. the Bible says this is the victory that overcomes the world, our faith. And so if you apply faith to any area of your life, if you do it consistently and persistently, it's going to produce victory. And it's the same in this area of your life. It's, you know, this area that so many people struggle with and wonder about. If you'll just apply faith to it, it will bring victory in this area. And you will just wake up one day and you'll just, you know, I, I know... 
you know, when I was sitting in my van one day with my two small children, and I had been quoting these scriptures, and, you know, just standing in faith and refusing to walk in worry and refusing to walk in fear over this, and just standing in faith that when, you know, when I died, that my purpose would be fulfilled. And so one day I was sitting in my van, and I, was, I had two small children in the very back seat, and um, uh, I was at the bank, and my babies had fallen asleep, so I was just sitting there, and I thought, I'm going to read my Bible for a minute. And I was just reading through, flipping through, just, you know, looking at different things. And all of a sudden, it was all of a sudden, one of the scriptures, and, and I'm not going to tell you which one it was because it's, you know, it's between me and God. But one of those scriptures just jumped off the page at me and into my heart and came alive. And the Lord started talking to me about what I was called to do and what he had put me on this earth to do. And it was completely different from anything that I had ever imagined or seen myself doing. You know, but there was no denying it. I mean, at that point in time, um, I, that was like t- uh, 12 years ago, I closed the Bible, and I never looked at that scripture again for about five years, because I was like, no way, I am not doing that. You have, you know, you got the wrong person. I'm not doing that. That's not who I am. But, you know, he started working on me, and he started working on me, and he started changing me from the inside out. And, and you know, God doesn't take no for an answer. He just doesn't, and he doesn't give up. And so... You know, but but I don't believe that would have happened if I had not started speaking these scriptures over myself. You know, the years years before when I was worried about my calling and I was worried about not having a clue what I was supposed to do and what I was called to do. You know, I I believe that because God watches over His Word to perform it in our lives, that's just a, a principle, an underlying principle that works across the board. And if you will, you know, if there's something that's going on in your life, you know, not even just this, but anything else, if you'll just speak scripture, speak the word of God, it's alive and it's active and it's operative and it's energizing and it will bring itself to pass in your life over any area. But specifically, you know, tonight we're talking about this area. So if you want a list of those scriptures that I've spoken over my life, you know, all these years, then I'll be glad to share that with you. You can just um, let me know your email. So, you know, having said that, a lot of times Christians get so intent and so focused on trying to figure out what they are called to do individually that they forget that there are things that God has called all of us to do as believers and that we all, that, that we all need to be focusing on. And one of those areas is found in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. So if you can turn with me there, Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. We're going to go go through a few of these areas that that um, a few of these things that God has called all of us as believers to do. And as we're pursuing these things, and as we're putting the Word of God in our heart over our own individual calling, one day you're going to look up and you're just going to find yourself fulfilling the purpose that God put you in the earth for. If you're not already doing it, so Matthew chapter twenty-eight verse nineteen says Jesus came up and spoke to them. And in saying, this is right after Jesus rose from the dead, right before he's going to ascend to the Father, and he's talking to the disciples, and he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth over the age. And so the first thing that we are all called to do as believers is to make disciples. That word in this scripture, that word disciple means to teach and to instruct. And so the first place that we're going to be making disciples, the most important place is, do you all know where that, where that might be? In your home, right? How many of you actually have children in your home still? We have no one in here that has children in their home. So anyways, the first place is in your home. And I remember years ago, um, you know, sitting on my couch, and I had a couple little kids playing around my feet. And I had been married for, for, you know, six years or so. And I was sitting on my couch, and I was just daydreaming about all the things that I wanted to do for God. You know, all the big dreams that I had of things that I wanted to accomplish for the kingdom of God. I wanted to, you know, I've always wanted to be a missionary, you know, ever since I can remember. I wanted to go to Africa and feed all those starving children. You know, those starving children you see on those commercials. You know, my motiva- one of my motivational gifts is compassion. I'm so compassion motivated. And when I see those commercials, I just want to be there with those children. I want to be there ministering to them and feeding them. 
And, you know, I was just sitting there daydreaming about, daydreaming about that. And I was thinking about, you know, the, the, um, the counseling center that I wanted to start for unwed mothers and, um, you know, for abused, um, abused girls. And I was sitting there thinking about all that. And the Holy Spirit, I remember exactly where I, you know, you have those moments in your life when the, you know that God has spoken to you and you remember them. They're like embedded in your memory forever. I remember the Holy Spirit spoke to me in that moment and that, and that still small voice that he had. And he said, Tara, I'm so glad that you have all these big dreams for the, of doing all this stuff for me. I'm so excited about what you want to do for me. He said, but, but here's what I want you to understand. Your first ministry and your most important ministry is to your husband. And your most important mission field is to these little children, you know, playing at your feet. He said, don't discount them because they're right in your face and they're little. He said, they're your most important mission field. And he said, I want you to focus on that right now. I want you to focus on becoming the very best wife you can be to your husband. I want you to focus on, on becoming his, the very best helpmeet that you can be to him. I want you to, to make sure that you are building him up and that you are being everything you need to be to him and helping him to become all that I've called him to be and helping him to fulfill, fulfill his purpose. He said, because as a, as a wife, that is your calling. That is your number one calling, your number one ministry. And I want you to focus on getting that right. And he said, and then I want you to realize that your number one mission field is to your children. And he said, I want you to take all the classes you need to take. I want you to read all the books that you need to read. I want you to, you know, listen to all the CDs you need to listen to in order to be able to disciple your children up in the Lord, to be able to teach them and instruct them and raise them in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And he said, I want you to focus on that right now. And he said, when you can get that right, when we, when, you know, when I see that you have, you have gotten um, everything that you need to, or you've, you've grown in that area as much as I want you to grow, then we'll think about focusing on these other bigger things. He said, basically what he was telling me is I want you to be faithful with what I've already trusted you with. And then I'll know that I can entrust you with more. And so, um, you know, I'm not saying that if you, you know, I know none of you have small children, but if, if you, even if you did have small children, that you can't go out and do big things for God while you have small children. But I, what I am saying is make sure that, that you are making what's top priority, top priority, and that you are making it a top priority to, um, to focus on that first mission field, which is your home. And so the second, um, our second mission field is um, everybody else in your sphere of influence, your job, your neighborhood, you know, your, your children's friends. Um, you know, the, the, first, your, the first way that you're going to be able to disciple those people is by being an example to them. And Titus, chapter, in chapter 2, that chapter is, the, the whole first beginning of the chapter is talking about discipling people and teaching people. And it says in, in verse 7, it says, You yourself must be an example to them by doing good works of every kind. Let everything you do reflect the integrity and the seriousness of your teaching. And so we've all heard that um, saying that actions speak louder than words. And so basically what this is saying is just, you know, live what you preach. Live, be, be willing to live a holy and godly life before, before your coworkers and before your peers and before all those people in your sphere of influence. Be willing to be that, one, that person who's, who's always willing to, do, you know, be out there blessing everybody else and doing good things for everybody else. And always, that, be that person that's always got that encouraging word. And he's always asking everybody, you know, is there anything I can pray for you for? You know, be that person. Be that person who's got, you know, a joyful and peaceful heart in the midst of, of you know, situations that are not that joyful and are not that peaceful. You know, because they're watching you. And they're, they're not going to be watching you so much in the good times. They're watching you in, in the challenging times. They're watching you when people are mistreating you. They want to see what you're going to do. They want to see if, you know, you practice what you preach. And... um So when, as you are that example, and as that, that example of that joyful, peaceful Christian in the midst of, you know, circumstances that are not that great, as you are the one that's the blessing to everybody around you, that's going to open doors for you to be able to disciple people. You know, my husband is one of the most amazing examples of this. Um, I just laugh every time he gets a new job because, um, you know, it's always the same process. He works, he works in sales. 
he works um, in the corporate world and he's, he sells computer equipment to large companies. And so, you know, he, he, wor he works with, um, he travels a lot. And so in that environment, there's always a lot of drinking going on. There's always a lot of cursing. There's always, you know, guys who are married, who are out, you know, carousing around, looking for women, cheating on their wives. He, he, he lives in, he works in that environment. And so he is not afraid to be different. He's not afraid to stand out and to stand up for what he believes in. I mean, he'll be, he'll be at, a group, at a table with five guys, and they're all ordering a beer, and he orders a Diet Coke. And, of course, they're all going, what's wrong with you? What are you, better than us, you know? And so, but he's not afraid to be different. He's not afraid to say, you know, when, when the guy, all the guys are going out to, to drink and party and crowds around and find women, he's not afraid to go back to his room early, even though, you know, it, it makes him the butt of the jokes and it makes him, you know, they're, they're like, you know, you think you're better than us? You know, this is always the process. Every time he starts a new job, this is, this is what he goes through. But then, you know, without fail, after he's been there a while, one by one, these guys, you know, they start coming to him and asking him questions. You know, why are you different? Why don't you drink with us? Why won't you go out with us? You know, what's different about you? And it opens the door for him, his example of that godly life and of being willing to be different. You know, he's lost, he's lost sales because of that. He's, he's even lost jobs because of his willingness to, you know, stand up and, and stand up for what he believes in. He sacrificed for that. But, you know, all those, those guys, one by one, they'll come to him and they'll start asking him questions. And it opens the door for him to be able to actually disciple them, begin to disciple them. That word to disciple, remember, means to teach and instruct. And, you know, even Jesus began to disciple people before they ever really accepted him. I mean, if you'll think about Nicodemus, you remember the story of Nicodemus? Nicodemus had not accepted Jesus when he went to him in the dead of the night. Um, you know, turn with me there in your Bibles to John chapter 3, verse 1, and we'll, we'll read about that. It's a really interesting story. about how Jesus' example opened the door for him to be able to witness and share the gospel. John chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now there was a certain man among the Pharisees named Nicodemus. He was a ruler, a leader, an authority among the Jews. And he came to Jesus at night. So Nicodemus was afraid to come to Jesus in front of his friends. He was afraid to seek Jesus out in front of his peers because he, you know, he didn't want them to think anything. So he comes to Jesus in the dead of the night, and he begins to ask Jesus questions. And he says, Rabbi, we know and are certain that you have come from, to, from God as a teacher. You know, he's obviously got some friends that he's, you know, under the radar talking, to, talking about Jesus with. And he says, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. Why does he know that? He says, for no one can do these signs, these wonder works, these miracles, and produce the proofs that you do unless God is with him. So Jesus' example opened the door for him to be able to witness and begin to disciple Nicodemus. And then Jesus answered him, I assure you most solemnly I tell you that unless a person is born again, anew from above, he cannot ever see, know, and be acquainted with and experience the kingdom of God. So Jesus begins at this point, in the dead of night, while nobody's looking, to explain the gospel to Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is interested in listening because of Jesus' example. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter his mother's womb again and be born? And Jesus answered, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a man is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot ever enter the kingdom of God. So don't ever be afraid to be different. Don't ever be afraid to stand up and to stand out for what you believe in. Because even though they might initially see it as a negative thing, they're going to they're gonna see you as, as, you know, when they need you. You know, these guys, they even come to Neil. Um, they'll, they'll email him and they'll call him individually while nobody else is around and ask him to pray for them. And so this is going to open the door for you to be able to witness to them and be, begin to disciple them. And so look for those opportunities. So the second thing that we're all called as believers to do is to be generous. Look in, first, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. We're going to read verse 10 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10. 
I'm going to read it out of the New Living Translation. It says, For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great, a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take our gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So God blesses us so that we can be generous. And if we will be generous with what God has blessed us with, and if we will be faithful with the tithe and, and giving into the kingdom of God, it says in Malachi chapter 3, verse 10, that God will then open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on us that we won't even have room enough to receive it. So as we give into the kingdom of God, as we are faithful to be generous and we are faithful to sow into those ministries that the Lord has put on our heart and we're faithful to build the house of God, then that in turn, in a roundabout way, we're actually providing for ourselves. I mean, a great example of this would be Elijah and the widow in the Old Testament. Do you all remember that story? In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah is actually living by a brook. He's living off the water in the brook, and, he, and God has instructed ravens to come and feed him. And so, you know, there's a famine going on in the land, and so, you know, God is providing for Elijah that way. And then pretty soon the, book, the brook dries up, and God instructs Elijah to go and find this widow. And so Elijah goes to this widow, and he asks her, you know, I need, if you, he asks her if she can bring him some water, and so she does. And then he asks her for food, and she says, listen, you know, all I've got is this one little cake. I'm going to make this one little cake, this one little piece of bread is all I have left, and I'm going to feed myself and my son this one last meal, and then we're going to die. We're going to starve. And Elijah said, listen, if you will provide for the kingdom of God first, if you will um, feed me, the man of God, the prophet of God first, then you will supernaturally be provided for throughout the rest of this famine. And she did, and she was. And so, you know, it's the same with us. If we will put God, the kingdom of God first, if we will provide for the kingdom of God first, then it doesn't matter what's going on in the world around us. It doesn't matter what's going on in the economy. God's going to supernaturally open doors of provision for us, and he's going to provide for us. And so that's the second thing that we're all called to do as believers. And the third thing is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12. While you're looking that up, the third thing is that we're all called to find our place in the body and serve. We're all called to figure out what are, what are our spiritual gifts and how can we minister to the body of Christ with those. We're all called to take our part in the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 says, The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews, some are Gentiles, some are slaves, and some are free. But we all have been baptized into one body, one spirit, and we all share the same spirit. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. If the foot says, I am not a part of the body because I am not a hand, that does not make it any less a part of the body. If the ear says, I am not a part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if the whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. So basically what this scripture and passage is saying is that we need you. You know, the body of Christ needs your gifts. It needs your, your talents and your abilities. God put those gifts and talents and, and abilities in you to be able to serve his kingdom and to serve his purpose. And so I think everybody in here has actually taken the spiritual gifts test and received, you know, back their their um, results, right? So I want to encourage you, if you have not actually found your place, if you've not um, found the place that where, you, where you can serve the body of Christ, I want, you to, I want to encourage you to go, go ahead and do that. Um, there's, a, there's a page in the, in the results there, in that, um, you know, what you, the results that you got back that talks about all the ministry opportunities that are suited for your set of spiritual gifts. And so I want to encourage you, if you have not, to go ahead and try some of those areas and see what fits you best and how you can best serve the body of Christ. Mm -hmm.